بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending him his greetings and salutations upon the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam The main focus of our discussion be it in later on today is to look at the role of the youth extracted from this famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi about seven individuals or seven types or categories of individuals being under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby there will be no shade that main theme of those young individuals that we find as we're going to come to inshallah that many of the youth or the young individuals they think that they are the only ones who are facing the temptations or facing the desires or facing the difficulties yes at times the level does change the environment does have a big impact but every single individual goes through those feelings or goes through those changes that nafs of the individual has temptations placed within it and the more the temptations are aroused the more that the person places himself inside a temptuous environment the more that feeling begins to develop and the more the dangers begin to develop in the mind of the individual and that's our role as teachers as practitioners is to take our people back to purity that's the essence of a Muslim and especially a young Muslim to live a life of purity it is very 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 abnormal for a Muslim to live an immoral life which unfortunately today has become a common practice amongst many Muslims young Muslims especially who live a life of disobedience corruption for wahish illicit behavior misconduct and then they return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereas alhamdulillah for many of our generation you find it was against the norm for a person to fall into the fawahish illicit behavior the misconduct that we find which unfortunately has become common practice possibly because there has not been enough engagement for many of us in trying to help our people where the Quran tells us كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ You are the best people ever raised up. You order the good and you forbid the evil. And then some six verses later that we find in Surah Ali Imran verse 110 وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٍ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ that there arise amongst you a group of people who order the good and forbid the evil. So maybe there may have been a lapse in our ordering the good and forbidding the evil that today we find the pitiful state of many of our shabab or many of our youth. Likewise, we know that we are surrounded by such slogans and statements which have been documented inside the Quran. أَخْرِجُوا آلَ لُوتٍ مِّنْ قَرْيَتِكُمْ إِنَّهُمْ أُنَاسٌ يَتَطَهَّرُونَ Get rid of the people of Lut السلام, They are people who want to be purified So these are the slogans that we even find today That people who are calling towards chastity Towards purity Living a good life We need to expel these individuals These are the fundamentalists These are the radical individuals Who are trying to destroy a good way of life The enjoyment that we have We need to get rid of these people 
And unfortunately, we find not just from non-Muslims, we find this perception, this thought among some Muslims as well, that we need to remove these religious clerics or these religious people who are preventing us from following a life of desires and temptations. And thus the Quran warns the Muslims severely in Alladina Yhibuna and Tashi al Fahisha to Filadina Amanu Lahum Adabun Animun fit dunya will a hero. Those people who love to spread vice, Fawahish, bad behavior amongst those people who believe Lahum Adabun Animun fit dunya of a hero. For them will be a severe punishment in this world and likewise inside the Akhirah. So that is a severe warning for Muslims to begin to think about their actions and their role and the impact of their actions upon the wider community around them. Likewise, we find that we need to develop this control because to gain paradise isn't something easy as, as many of us we may begin to think. Thus, if you go and read the book of Paradise in Sahih Muslim, because obviously Sahih Muslim, many of us may not be able to complete the reading of this magnanimous work. But there are certain chapters, certain kutub that we can go back and extract them and read them in our life to see the fawaid and the benefits. Read awwalan, firstly, Kitabul Iman. Read the book of Iman by Sahih Muslim. That is how he begins his compilation. And as some of the ulama have gone to the view that Sahih Muslim in his tartib and his collection of ahadith at times is more fruitful than the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. Even though Imam Bukhari, without a doubt, is the strongest book in authenticity. But some are preferred because of the certain ahadith that Imam Muslim collects. And the way that he makes his tartib and his collection, there are many fawa'i that can be extracted from it. So read Kitabul Iman, the book of Iman in the beginning. Likewise, towards the end, read the book of Kitabul Jannah, wa sifatu na'imiha wa ahliha. Read the book of Paradise and the blessings and the characteristics of the people of paradise. So then you begin to understand what is my journey upon this earth. The Quran as it begins by talking about Iman, الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The believers, the muttaqun, the pious individuals are those who believe in the unseen because the whole of the journey of the Quran is a journey of the unseen, things that we cannot imagine, we cannot see. Thus we find in the Hadith Qudsi, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعِبَادِي الصَّالِحِينَ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرْ I prepared for my servants, the pious individuals, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and the feeling, the perception, the thought hasn't come upon the heart or the mind of any individual. That's the journey of the whole life of a Muslim, that many things have been taken away from this earth. There are at times, لَهُمُ الْبُشْرَى فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Bushra is given to the believer because we need that encouragement to carry on inside our life. But the real Bushra, the real ending, the real goodness is stored for the believer inside the Akhirah. So thus we need to read about those blessings that have been restrained or kept away from us. So we know that our journey isn't a worse, wasted journey. That's why you find the more weaker the Iman regarding Yawm al Akhirah, the more weaker the journey becomes. The more stronger one's aqidah, one's belief, one's perception, one's devotion, the more strength in that journey. Man will only have that which he struggles for, and every man will see his end result. The efforts that he made upon this earth will be shown by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Sunnah Allah ala al ard wa fis sama. Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon this earth as well. You strive towards kufr, towards disbelief, you'll be entering into more kufr and disbelief. You strive for the dunya, you enter more into the dunya. You strive for the world and the pleasure of the world, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open that dunya, those pleasures up for the individual. That's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the earth in general. And like God, you find whoever strives for the akhirah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show that person the paths of this dunya, and likewise the path of the akhirah. والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا Whoever strives in our paths, we show them our paths. The paths of khair, of goodness upon this earth. And likewise, the end result of those believers inside the akhirah. So this is the struggle that the man has to believe in. The struggle towards the akhirah. That's why the ulama they mentioned, 
من ف... من فوائد the benefits of belief in يوم الآخرة is a person begins to struggle even more, begins to strive even more in that return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the Quran mentions about those individuals who begin to follow actions because some people they believe that al-amal, actions have got nothing to do with iman. Al-iman huwa tasdiqun bil-qalbi aw ikraru bil lisani Some people believe as long as I have the conviction in my heart and I utter it with my tongue, فَهَادَ يَكْفِينِي This is sufficient for me. This is khata, mistake in aqeed of Ahl Sunnah. وَالْعَمَلْ بِالْجَوَارِحِ Actions of the limbs. جُزْءٌ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ That is the aqeed of Ahl Sunnah in a nutshell. Belief, conviction inside the heart, testimony upon the tongue, and you carry out the action to show that you are a believer. وَالْإِيمَانِ يَزِيدُ بِالطَاعَةِ وَيَنْقُصْ بِالْمَعْصِيَةِ Iman goes up via obedience and it goes down via disobedience. You understand this? You've understood the creed of Ahl Sunnah. Simple. As well as modernistic view, the people they come and they say that actions are not important. Why throughout the Quran, the Quran is replete. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Except for those who believe and do righteous actions, you always find it put together. You never find it separated, just about actions. So some of these modernistic Muslims are falling into the trap that it's just about believing. It's sufficient. This is a deviant view that eventually drifts you away from the creed of Ahl Sunnah. So the Muslims are those individuals who believe and carry out the actions. ما سلككم في سقر What made you end up going into سقر وسقر من أسماء جهنم قالوا لم نكن من المسلين They said we never used to bother praying. ولم نكن نطعم المسكين وكنا نخوض مع الخائرين وكنا نكذب بيوم الدين we never used to bother praying. We never used to feed the poor. We used to waste our time with the people just wasting their time. Until what? The, any, the time or the reality came upon us. Then the person begins to reflect and begins to think. So why did these people end up going into Jahannam? They never used to bother praying in their life. So Muslims who believe I don't need to do certain actions. As long as my heart is clean, that is sufficient. What does the Quran say? The Quran says, "Ala ya'lamu man khalaq, wa huwa al-latif al-khabir." Does not Allah subhanahu wa taala know what He has created, and He is the most subtle, the most aware? These people, in essence, are actually challenging Allah subhanahu wa taala by saying that my heart is clean. Allah subhanahu wa taala has laid out hudud, laws, regulations. We have to follow those laws and regulations because Allah subhanahu wa taala created us and knows the nature of the human being. Zuyyin al-nasi hubu shahwat min al-nisa wa al-banin. والقناطير المقنطرة من الذهب والفضة والخيل المصومة والأنعام والحرف ذلك متاع الحياة الدنيا والله عنده حسن المآب زين للناس حب الشهوات من النساء Man has been created to love what? Women, children, gold, silver, property, branded horses, the land So a person comes along and says Well the Sharia talks about this or talks about this but I don't have that feeling inside my heart. There's no haraj in me mixing with women or talking to women or doing this or doing that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows my heart is pure. Either you are lying or the Quran is lying. Simple. If you say the Quran is lying, فَهَذَا كُفَرْ Takes you kharij عَنِ الْمِلَّةِ Takes you out the fold of Islam. The Quran highlights the natural nature of the human being. So the Muslim should be vigilant of not falling into that trap to begin to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so these, peop- these people that we find فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا In their hearts is a sickness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased that sickness inside their hearts. That people begin to say that my Islam فِي قَلْبِي مَا عَمَلْ فِي قَلْبِي Everything is inside my heart. أَوْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنْظُرُ إِلَى صُورِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَى أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَنْظُرُ إِلَى قُلُوبِكُمْ They hide behind this hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look at your faces, doesn't look at your image doesn't look at your clothing, but rather looks into your hearts. But go back and collect all of the ahadith. وفي بعض الروايات that we find, وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَإِلَىٰ أَعْمَالِكُمْ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at your hearts and looks at what? Your actions. So this hadith goes against them. But they want to just take those ahadith, they try to defend, hide behind it that my actions have got nothing to do with my iman. So all of us need to strive in strengthening our iman and strengthening our actions in that return journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we read the book of paradise, we begin to see the fruits of our iman. 
And obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا تَوْفِيقِي إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ At-Tawfiq min Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that gives the person the ability to carry out one's actions. And that's the person who becomes more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدًا لَكُمْ If you be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase that individual whether it be the word but even more it will be those actions in coming closer and closer towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So I advise myself and the rest of your respective brothers and sisters to read that chapter of paradise and likewise the chapter of Iman and go back and read the various shuruhat of the ulama Any other hadith that you're going to extract from the book of paradise is a famous hadith when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He created paradise and created the hellfire and thus we find that when Jibreel alayhi salam came and he saw paradise he said that whoever sees paradise the beauty, the embezzlement, the glitter, the glamour will want to do what? dive straight into paradise and whoever sees Jahannam the anguish, the punishment, the torture, the rage, the fire will want to do what? stay away from it so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Cover up paradise with obstacles. Surrounded, paradise is surrounded by obstacles. Cover up the fire with shahwat. Every path of desires and temptations brings you closer to what? Towards the hellfire. So the lesson here, to get into paradise, there are obstacles that we need to overcome. Imam al nawawi explaining in a Sahih Muslim in some 18, 19 volumes that you find explaining this hadith he highlights centuries ago there are four obstacles we need to overcome to come into paradise the first obstacle that we need to develop or we need to overcome inside our life is al ijtihad fil ibadat is to strive regarding our ibadat the fundamentals of our belief the fundamental actions that we need to be preserving them and guarding them as for example the prayers that we find hafidhu Guard your prayers And especially the middle prayer The most accurate statement is The middle prayer is Salat al-Asr And stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala In a state of devotion Likewise Ramadan Performance of Hajj That we find giving of Zakah These are all Al-Ibadat The persons who strive and struggle In perfecting his Ibadat And striving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala The second thing that he mentions is what's known as qadmul ghayr literally swallowing one's anger so obviously many of us may do their ibadah that we are in comfortable with our rituals but these characteristics you find many muslims or many young muslims are not able to control their anger literally means to be able to swallow one's anger that's the second obstacle one needs to overcome to get into paradise the third obstacle he mentions is al-afu is to be able to forgive people which once again is a very difficult obstacle to overcome so many of us could have the ibadah many of us get angry for reasons which are trivial which are not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then even if it is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're not able to pardon whereas the Quran it mentions that the muttaqun the pious individuals are those alladheena yunfiquna fi sarra'i wa darra those who spend their time of hardships and times of goodness which a Muslim may be able to do then read the rest of the characteristics those who swallow their anger those who swallow their anger and who pardon people forgive them, overlook the mistakes of people or what people may say towards them Allah loves the doers of good some of us were not able to carry out these characteristics some of us have fallen short many times in these characteristics because we only stick to certain things you have to take Islam and it shall mean try your best in everything to develop that not just to work upon certain elements and stick to them the fourth thing that he mentioned which concerns us which written centuries ago is a sabr and his shahawad to have patience to stay away from temptations and desires so centuries ago Imam Nawi says that the meaning of this hadith to gain get into paradise al-makarih the dislike things or the obstacles a Muslim needs to overcome to get into paradise are these four main elements to become observant regarding your religious duties obligations you have to carry out to be able to swallow your anger to be able to forgive mankind and to be able to control yourself not to fall into desires so this is a lesson yani, for all of us the young and the old you need to focus yani, upon this and thus we find 
that we know that the environment has a big impact of what the ulama mentioned was known as the gharizah they need the shahwa or the desire the person has in it within themselves and the wider community the more it's full of temptation desires will begin, begin to have a big impact upon the, the nafs of the soul of the individual to come towards that gharizah or come towards those desires but once again if you go back to the prophetic traditions you find the advice of the Prophet Muhammad on how to tame the desires within oneself. What do we find? Learn how to ride a horse, learn how to race, learn how to wrestle, use a sword, use a spear. All these formats, what do we find? If you learn how to swim, are all elements that tire the body. Any form of physical exertion that you find, the ulama have talked about, about medicine as well, they will burn and they will drown the desires of the individual. In other words, any form of hard labor, any type of physical combat or sport will break the desires of the individual and bring them down to a low level. And you can see the state of many of the, the Muslim youth, they're not engaged in anything. It's either one extreme to another extreme, either just mental ability or it's, it's social ability or it's just spiritual ability or it's just physical ability. The Muslim in every single ability. One's mind, one's body, one's soul, one's iman, everything the Muslim tries to strive to excel, to become any the ideal, any human being or the individual. And thus we find what many of us may have studied in medicine, etc. The level of testosterone is higher in who? In men. Being classified, the higher level of testosterone is placed inside men, that they have an e easier opportunity or their desires are built upon easily. Even the Quran mentions that. In the nafsa, you know the nafs, all of us, when it's placed inside that environment, will come towards Su. None of us are angels, and you look at the context of these ayat, he's talking about Yusuf السلام, and what took place. That the soul, if it's given the opportunity, will come towards evil. So even Yusuf السلام, when he was tempted, and then when he saw the evidence, and here the ulama of the Fasid begin to discuss, what did he see? Some say that there was a baby in the room that spoke. Some say that he saw the image of his father, he spoke to him. Others say he heard a voice. Whatever it may be, the ulama of tafsir have collected. But what we find, that he was able to overcome the inclinations, the whisperings that were coming towards him, the temptation. He was surrounded in an environment of full temptation, whereby the wife of the Aziz and he adorned herself in her beauty and she shut the doors and exposed herself to him. But he was one who restrained himself. And that's towards the end of the surah it mentions, وَيَصْبِرْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ عَجْرَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Whoever has patient fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because taqwa is the element that takes a person away from so many different things وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُهُ Whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides a way out for that individual and gives that person sustenance whereby they cannot imagine So the fawaid of taqwa thamarat of taqwa are many that Yusuf alayhi salam, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِي وَيَصْبِرْ Whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient, patient and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never let the action of doers of good go to waste. And thus we can see that how the woman herself acknowledged her mistake. All the women acknowledged their mistake. And he was made bari, made free from what they attributed toward Yusuf alayhi salam. Another lesson that we can extract regarding young individuals inside uh, Surah Yusuf, Alayhi salam, we find the 12th chapter of the Quran, a side point, those of, those, of us, those of us who may have not read the surah, it is the only one surah in the Quran that begins with a story and ends with a story. It's the only one surah. It begins with a story and travels all the way until the end of the surah and the end of the surah begins to talk about some other topics. But in general, some hundred or so ayat that we find are talking all about the life and the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. And some of the ulama tafasir have mentioned that this surah is sent down, what is described as Aram al huzn the year of grief upon the Prophet Muhammad that he was going through difficulties, wife Khadija has passed away and the hardship that the Quraysh had placed upon him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this surah upon the Prophet Muhammad to see, look at how the previous Prophet Yusuf alayhi what he went through and the difficulties that he went through. And not to sound too mystical, at times you're feeling upset or sad, go back and read this surah and you'll see that the, the problems are very, we face in our daily life are very trivial to what Yusuf alayhi salam had to go through in his life. Anyhow, what concerns us here at the beginning of the surah is the brethren of Yusuf alayhi salam. That they decide because of their jealousy towards him, that they decide either to kill him or then they decide that we should throw him into the well. And then what did they make the statement? وَتَكُونُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ After we do this evil action, 
then we're going to come back and become what righteous and pious individuals. That mantik, that logic that existed centuries ago, you know what? It exists even today. Because how many Muslims think exactly the same? How many Muslims they think I'll do haram all my life or when I become a lahad or become a, like you at the age of 40, whatever it may be, or I marry or settle down, then I'll come back and become a good Muslim. That's what many, many of the youth they think. Any Muslim, they know better than us what's halal, what's haram. Many people, they know better than us because they're telling us all day, quoting a hadith to us, quoting Quran to us, telling us, teaching us every single day. But once again, the amal is not there. Or they're trying to play games with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what Quran mentions. وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَصُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَٰئِكَهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Don't become like those individuals who forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you forget your own selves. What is the meaning of forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Forgetting means is turning away from the sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turning away from that which is halal and going towards that which is haram. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes you forget your own self, what your intent is and what you're doing. Like as the Quran mentions harsh words. That whoever, well, woman a'arada an dhikri fa inna lahu ma'ishatan dhanka wa nahshiru yawm al-qiyamati a'ma qala rabbi lima hashartani a'ma wa qad kuntu basira qala kathalika atatka ayatuna fa nasitaha wa kathalika al-yawma tunsa Inside Surah Taha that we find Woman a'arada an dhikri Whoever turns away from the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns away from it You find two promises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala That person, that individual will have what? Ma'ishat al will have a restricted life, will have a troublesome life. There will be no peace, no tranquility, no serenity, nothing inside their life. Wa'adullahi subhanahu wa ta'ala upon this earth. That's the first promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you can study that in great, great detail in people who turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then comes the second promise. وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى Kafif, Darir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, blind. قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَا حَشَدْتِ لِيَعْمَى Oh my Lord, why are you making me blind today? وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا I could see when I was upon this earth. I had the vis visibility to see. Why am I blind today? The answer is given. Because you know upon this earth, our signs were shown to you. What are the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? أَمَّا آيَاتٌ قَوْنِيَا The heavenly signs all around us. سَنَرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ we show them our signs all around them in the heavens, the earth, the horizon. And they'll establish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the truth. Is the reality, the only one that needs to be worshipped. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa fi anfusikum afala Even within your own souls, we show you our signs, you begin to recognize. Can you not see them? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that needs to be worshipped. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار Indeed the creation, the heaven and the earth, the changing of the night and the day, a sign for men of understanding, those who stand, those who bow down, those who prostrate, who reflect over all of this. ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا Our Lord, you haven't created this in vanity. There must be a purpose. These are all ayatul qawmiyyah that drives the individual to begin to reflect and recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ وَإِلَى السَّمَاءِ كَيْفَ رُفِعَتْ Don't you look at the hump of the camel, how it stores the water. Don't you look at the heavens, the earth, the land, all of these are signs for the individual to come back and reflect and to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there is one meaning of ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other meaning of ayat, ayatul Qur'an. The verses of the Quran which are clear that a person doesn't see the signs, the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have an impact upon that individual because the Quran that we find is very, very powerful in nature that we find. In this Quran, the same ayat inside Surah Al Hashat towards the end. We sent this Quran down upon a mountain. It will turn the mountain into what? Into dust, into crumbs. That's the power of the Quran. But the Quran has come where? Upon the hearts of us human beings. And that's amongst the first parable inside Surah Al-Baqarah that we find, that there are stones. Stones that you find that water gushes out of them. Some of them, you strike them, you find that water gushes out of them. And amongst them, 
يعني يحبط من خشية الله. Some stones, rocks, they fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى. How can a rock fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى? But Allah سبحانه has created that that even the rock recognizes Allah سبحانه وتعالى. What is the intent of this myth and this parable? That if a rock fears Allah سبحانه وتعالى, then why does the soft heart of the human being fear Allah سبحانه وتعالى? ألم يأني للذين آمن أن تخشى قلوبهم لذكر الله وما نزل من الحق؟ Has not the time come for the hearts of the believers that their hearts become soft and lenient with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's the power of the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-ladhina aman wa yatma'innu qulubuhum bi dhikri Allah ala bi dhikri Allahi tatma'innu al-qulub. And in the believers of those individuals, their hearts find tranquility and rest with what? With the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those are the real believers. Al-ladhina wajidat qulubuhum that their hearts begin to quiver and shake. With the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ When the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recited upon them, it increases them in the iman and they place their trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those are the ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown and highlighted to us. Likewise, in the night journey that we find the Prophet Muhammad who sees a person coming out of the, of the water surrounded by blood. And every time the person, a rock is being thrown, into that face or into the head of that individual. Who is that individual at the end of the long hadith that we find? That is an individual, الذي نام عن القرآن The person who learned the Qur'an and slept away from the Qur'an. بمعنى never implemented the Qur'an. القرآن حجة لك أو حجة عليك The Qur'an is an evidence for you or an evidence against you. Not just the recitation of the Qur'an, it's the implementation of the Qur'an. So that is dangerous, turning away from the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you turn away, you forgot the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَكَذَلِكَ الْيَوْمَ تُنْسَى That's today you have been forgotten by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we fail to understand the time, uh, the, the maximum opportunity or focus of the life of the individual is in that prime time. In that opportunity to focus oneself towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus you find this strange hadith وَعَنْ أُقْبَى مَرْفُوعًا إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَيَعْجَبُ لِشَابْ لَا شَبْوَةً لَهُ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala marvels at a young boy, a young individual, لَا شَبْوَةً لَهُ Has no, yani, بِمَعْنَى لَا يَمِيلُ إِلَى الْهَوَى Doesn't go towards desires. Imam al-Mannawi explains his hadith, Sahib al-Fayd al-Qadir mentions, فَإِنَّ هَذَا يَنِي شَيْءٌ عَجِيبٌ أو شَيْءٌ نَادِرٌ This is something very, very rare because most people want to come to his desires. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising the one individual or a young individual who breaks one's desires and doesn't come towards them. So this individual, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising this individual and this is something very, very rare, but it's not something which is really impossible. Likewise, a discussion begins to take place amongst the ulama of Tazkiyah that a person who makes a mistake and then repents and becomes a better individual, is that person, young person, a better individual or a person who never ever entered into anything haram. So a long discussion begins to take place. Some of them begin to favor a person who never ever journeyed through haram. is far better than a person who may have done something incorrect, fall into shahwa desires and, and then you need re- re- repented. But what we can extract that obviously the task is what? It is a difficult task. There's no doubt it is a difficult task, especially in the new 21st century that we live in, the modern world that we live in. It's become even more difficult. But that difficult task means what? An immense reward. What is the immense reward that we've given to those individuals? And that is, as we mentioned, the seven individuals, or the category of types of individuals under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sab'atun yudilluhum Allahu fi dhillihi yawma la dhilla illa dhilluhu. Seven types of individuals will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby there will be no shade. Amongst the seven individuals that we find, Imamun Adil, the just Imam, Imam wa shabun nash'a fi ibadatillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala which concerns us here the young boy or the young girl who spent their life worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the end of their life or an elderly individual a person going to the age of 50 or 60 that's normal you know that's normal for an individual who get, gets excuse expression one foot inside the grave to begin to make tawbah to begin to repent to come to the masjid frequently that's normal that's something khayr something good but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want that. Because that's a normal, only a senile person would stay away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that end of their life. But it's the prime time of one's life. Shabun, 
نشأ في عبادة الله سبحانه وتعالى. The second category. Just to complete the hadith. ورجل قلبه معلق بالمساجد. A man whose heart is linked to the masjid. Hadith. Another hadith I find which is da'if, which is weak. But the believer finds himself in the masjid like a person in an ocean. And the heart is open. But a munafiq finds himself inside the masjid like what? Like a bird in a cage. So if you come to the masjid and you find any qala, you find restriction, you find difficulty, you find confusion within yourself. Why am I inside the masjid? فَهَذَا نَوْعٌ مِنَ النِّفَاقُ It's an element of hypocrisy. The believer finds tranquility, happiness inside the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So man whose heart is attached to the masjid. In a sahih hadith that we find, the individual who visits the masjid frequently, فَشْهَدْ لَهُ الْإِيمَانِ Testify that individual has what? Iman. Who comes to the masjid frequently. So many people, once again, they come and they say, Salatul Jama'ah, anywhere you can go and pray. Possibly true. So what's the point in building the masjid then? If you can pray Salatul Jama'ah wherever you want to go and pray, wherever you are with the Jama'ah, then what's the intent of the masjid? Why do we find, Bashiru Basharina Billayl, give the glad tidings of individuals who are walking in the night, in the depths of the night. What is the depths of the night? Salatul Fajr and Salatul Isha. They're still coming towards the masjid. That's a sign of Iman, a sign of hypocrisy, is what? The person drags themselves to come for Salatul Fajr, doesn't want to pray Salatul Fajr, or doesn't want to come for Salatul Isha inside the masjid. That's an element of hypocrisy. Sign of Iman is a person wants to come to Fajr. A person begins to question themselves, leave the, read the life of the Sahaba. If one of them miss Salatul Jama'ah, they would hide. They would hide from the other companions, they missed it. And then secretly go hide in the crevices and secretly go and pray. And that's they used to conclude. Anybody who missed Salatul Jama'ah, either they were traveling or they were severely ill. And you know, as a side point, even the Munafiqun never miss prayer behind who? Behind the Prophet Muhammad, lest they be spotted. And what do we do today? We don't care much about it. Every day we miss Fajr bin Jama'ati. It's not that important, it doesn't mean much. Miss Isha bin Jama'ati doesn't mean much. What do you mean it doesn't mean much? That is a sign of Iman. That's a sign of the pillar of Islam, of devotion. Successful are the individuals, those pious individuals who are submissive inside their prayers, those who guard their prayers, preserve their prayers. That's an element. So many of us may begin to fall into other issues and begin to worry about them, which is good, which is khayr. And then we begin to lose track and focus upon this element. And thus we find the hadith of Mu'jam al-Imam Tabarani إِنَّمَا أَوَّلُ مَا يُحَاسِبُ الْعَبْدِ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ إِذْ أَسْسَلَاءُ كَمَا قَالْ صلى الله عليه وسلم The first thing the person will ask about the Day of Judgment will be their prayers. First thing, then everything else, then everything will come after that. So if we're not really bothered about it, we find it trivial, we find it something petty, or what's this got to do with the impact of the rising of the Muslim Ummah, or whatever it may be, then you can see that there will be no rising. Even the blessed land of Palestine at the moment may sound very, very harsh. Go and see how many people come for Salatul Fajr, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Go and see how many people يَحْتَمُونَ بِصَلَاتِهِمْ who are worried about their prayers, focus upon their prayers. The answer is very simple in the Sharia. It's very simple. Yes, we have external enemies, whatever it may be. But our biggest enemy is who? Is our own nafs, our own self. That's what needs to be conquered and ruled and governed over. And we begin to understand the element that these are the elements of dignity that rise the Muslim Ummah once again towards and need their success. Likewise, just to complete the hadith that we find, وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَّ فِي اللَّهِ اجْتَمَعْ عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ Two individuals who come together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they separate upon that. They haven't come together because of wealth or property or fame or friendship upon this dunya. They've come for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they separate upon that. That's the only reason why they meet and they are together. Thus you find that this bond or khuwa islamiyah that you find that sometimes the Islamic brotherhood makes a stronger link between oneself and another individual even than your own blood brother. That's what Iman does. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ Indeed believers are brothers towards one another. That's the bond of faith. That you find that naturally a person, when a person is upon any kufr, fusuq, isyan, even if it happens to be your own blood relative, what happens? You find a repulsive feeling towards them. You don't want to be with them, but people of Iman, that you want to be what? They are closer to you 
than even your own, any you blood relatives and your, your ties that we all have. Fourthly, we find وَرَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصُبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ Once again, concerning a young individual, that a beautiful woman of lineage, of honor, of dignity, passes, makes a pass to an individual, and likewise could be the opposite, the woman could be tempted as well. And what does a person say? قَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is another individual or that category that will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby there will be no shade. وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ بِصَدَقَةٍ فَأَخْفَاهَا حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمَ شِمَالُهُ مَا تُنْفِقُ يَمِينُهُ Person who hides the giving of their charity, giving of their wealth, that the, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand has spent. And seventhly we find وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهُ خَالِيًا فَفَادَتْ عَيْنَاهُ a person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity, all on his own or on her own, and the person begins, you need to shed tears remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hadith in the Sahih, in the Sahihain of Imam Bukhari and Muslim. These are the seven, seven different types of individuals or the categories. You find that Imam, uh, one of the ulama, uh, Imam Ibn Abdul, Abdul Bar al Andalusi, he mentions, فَإِنَّ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَفْضَلُ الْحَدِيثِ فِي الْفَضَائِلِ the best book or the best hadith on fadail, on virtues, is this one hadith. That's one of the ulama. He wrote mujalladan. He wrote two complete volumes. Each volume some 500 pages. Wa asasu shah had al hadith. And the essence of those 1,000 pages is this one hadith. That the Sheikh begins to expand this one hadith talking about these three individuals. And what do these individuals share? What is it that all of these seven categories that they share that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed them under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ishtirafuhum fi mukhalafati ahwa'ihim They all share of breaking their desires. Each one of them breaks their desires to gain it. Imam Adil, why a just Imam? Because you know most of the, not to sound too political, the imma around us, meaning you need the hukam that we find. What do we find around us? Are they just? Are they fair? So a just Imam is very rare Because a person knows that when I'm in power and control the Sultan He can do whatever he wants to do He can punish whomever he wants, torture whomever he wants, take from whoever he wants, do whatever he wants to do But the just Imam does what? He breaks his desires Because he's doing it for who? Lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala So he breaks that control and the power, that egoism that we find Many of these people around us, it's their ego Their ego is driving them, their ego is something very very dangerous you can't place a price tag upon the ego of an individual. And that's what some of these people that they have. People may hint to them, people may advise them, people may write something in a mild manner or point to something. And what happens? You find that people's heads will begin to roll. Because this is a threat towards my kingdomship, towards my sovereignty, towards my power, my governance, my ruling, my authority. These people need to go. So that's Imam Adil, the just Imam, will be one under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what you find? Shabun who grows up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is breaking what? The desires. As we began with, every young individual has desires. If a person says, I don't have desires, there must be something wrong with them. So every individual is sharing that breaking the desire. Like by the one who's spending his wealth, is breaking desire. The person loves wealth. You're never going to attain piety until you don't spend on the things that you love. So all these individuals are sharing that element of breaking the desires and moving away from the desires so they can come under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, you find that in general, all of us will be asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about our life, about our wealth, about our knowledge, and even more so what will happen? Regarding when we were young, what did we do with our young days? So it's not going to ask about our uh, uh, later days, what did we do? So our, our feet won't move on the day of judgment until they're asked about all or about, about these five elements. What did we do whilst we were young individuals? Did we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or spend any our life any appropriate in the hadith in the Sunan of Imam Yani Tirmidhi? Thus you find many of the Salafs used to mention such statements, Ya Ma'ashara Shabab, Imalu, or young individuals, carry out actions. Strive in doing actions. Indeed, I've seen that doing actions whilst a young individual is strength, is power, is dignity. Just like the sun. You find the shams that you find for shamsu la tamla'u nahar fi akhirihi kama tamla'u fi yani awwalihi. The sun that we find, yani, in the beginning of the sun, going past the meridian, 
is the peak time of its life. And as it begins to descend and it begins to come down, it begins to yani, the time just before Maghrib that we find, it's still classified as a sun, but it's weak. The most powerful time of the sun is right in the middle. And likewise, a powerful time of a young individual is when the sun is rising at its powerful point. That is when the, the young individual strives in serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, other individuals are mentioned, and yani you find that the young individual, the human being, is like a tree. And thus you find that a tree, towards the end of its life, it loses its, its, its fruits, loses its benefits. There may be some trees that give fawa'id at a later stage, at the end of their life. But the general sunnah of ashjar is a certain peak time that it gives its fruits. Then after that, it just becomes khashab, just becomes an empty bark, just becomes wood. Still could be called a tree, but it's just khashab, it doesn't have much to give, to offer. So when is the tree life of the human being? The tree life of the human being is when it gives its fruits, it gives the blossom, it gives the benefits, is when the person is young. After that, you still could be a tree, but you are an empty tree. So that is the tree that we want to be the tree that gives fruits at all times. When we're young, and then those fruits begin to begin to develop later on inside Yani, the end of our life as well. And as you find in Surah Ibrahim, you find the parable is given of the goodly tree. The goodly tree is the tree that you find lives upon the life of Kalima Tayyiba, lives a life of Yani Qawlu Thabit, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. That's you find that the good word is like a good tree that you find has a strong, firm, you know, its roots are firm in the earth and its branches going up in the heavens. And every so often it begins to give its fruits, give its benefits. So when will we be able to develop those benefits? Especially when we are young you know, and focus, you know, inshallah, in the individuals. So we need to go back, look at the role of those individuals who came before us. The role of the youth that previously came, as the Quran mentions, الَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Those who responded to the call of Allah and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who were most of those individuals, if you look carefully? They were young individuals. مُعْلَمُ sahaba. Most of the companions were what? They were young individuals. We go back and read the seerah in great, great detail. The sacrifices they made and what they overcame and serving in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and then in serving the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Likewise, you find inside Surah Al-Kahab as well, before we move into the main field of the companions, you look at Surah Al-Kahab, what do we find? That those young individuals, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ There were young boys, young men, who believed in their Lord, and we did what? We increased them in guidance. So the Qur'an is praising that the young individuals who remain focused, that we increase them inside knowledge and understanding and in wisdom and in devotion and commitment. Like when you read the Tafsir of Surah Al-Buruj, you read the Tafsir of Surah Tafsir Ibn Kathir, what do you find? The main theme, talking about who? Al-Malik wal Ghulam, the boy and the king. One boy, young individual, devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that makes what happens, what takes place? A whole empire crumbles. The whole kingdom crumbles because why? Of this young individual remaining steadfast. There was no way to kill him. Except for the way that the boy highlighted that you have to take an arrow from my quiver, from my bag, from my sack, take an arrow, and then you take that arrow with my bow, and you say, in the name any of the Lord of the any of this boy, and then aim that arrow towards any my forehead, my, my temple here, and you'll be able to kill me. And when the king does that, he shoots that arrow and the boy dies. What did people begin to say? We believe in the Lord of the boy. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mission has been completed. That is exactly what he feared. Exactly what he feared. And that's exactly what began to need to take place. But it was the iman of the young individual who, who carried out the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remained steadfast all the way until meeting any Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like what we mentioned, look at the masses of the companions who read through their lives, young individuals, Mu'adim and Jabal. Young boys classified as what? The most knowledgeable regarding halal and haram. Today, what do we find? A young, do we find that? Do we find young individuals aspiring to be fuqaha, to be ulama? Do you find that? Very rare. No, there isn't it. Most young individuals couldn't care less. So we can see what begins to take place inside the future. Likewise, we find 
any uh, Ibn Abbas, Abdullah Ibn Abbas, young individual, classified as what? Turjuman al Quran, the one who explained the Quran because the Prophet Muhammad placed his, his mantle, his cloak over him and prayed for him, Allahumma faqihu fi deen wa alimhu ta'wil. Give him deep understanding of the deen wa alimhu ta'wil. Ta'wil bi ma'na tafsir and give him deep understanding regarding the Quran. So that's he had the, the best understanding of tafsir of the Quran, the ayat of the Quran. That's his famous student, Imam Mujahid, said, I read the need, the Quran, verse by verse, every single verse, at least three times. And I've got the explanation from Ibn Abbas, radiallahu Why? Prayed by the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu for this young individual, leading the people inside prayer as a young, unique individual. These are the companions that we find we need to go back and read in the life and begin. You need to understand, you need, uh, about them. Osama bin Zaid, the age of not more than being 20, the final expedition of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he places who? Osama bin Zayn as the leader of the whole of the army. So even some of the elderly companions begin to think, how is that possible? A young boy at the age of 20, we've got so much experience. How can the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam place Osama bin Zayn in that position? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passes away from this dunya, so maybe that's an opportunity to change, place somebody more experienced there. What does Abu Bakr do? Guess what? He keeps Osama bin Zaid. Because if he's been chosen by the Prophet Muhammad, there's no need to remove him, in respect of his age. But there must be wisdom, there must be devotion, there must be commitment that the Prophet Muhammad selected him. Likewise, you find many individuals that think that maybe the companions don't know about a good life. They don't know about the modern world of dressing well, looking well, enjoying this dunya. Read the life of Musa ibn Umayyah. Read about his life. How he used to dress, his silk garments, his perfume used to come from Yemen. If you walk past in the marketplace in Mecca, everybody knew. Everybody knew that, you know, Musa ibn Umayyad had just walked past us. That's the life that he lived, that he had. But then when he became a Muslim, if you read through his seerah, if I'm not mistaken, the battle of Uhud that we find, whereby his, his arm is amputated, his left arm is amputated, and eventually he falls shaheed. And you find that what happens, the companions, when they go to bury him, and they find that there's a cloth, when they cover his head, his feet begin to show. When they cover his feet, his head begins to show. And some of them begin to weep and think, this is the same Musa bin Umayyad who wore the best garments, who wore the best clothing, and today we cannot even cover his body today. So they asked the messenger, Ya Rasulullah, sallam, what should we do? He said, cover his head, sallam, and leave his feet and place in the in the green grass upon his feet and bury him in that manner. Many of the companions, they wept. This is the same individual who's happened to him today. But obviously he's made a greater journey. So they made many sacrifices. Don't think we are the only ones that we see the things of the dunya and we're facing difficulties. The companions, as we mentioned, they had those <laughs> desires. They had those temptations. Many of them, they, over, they overcame them. And thus they became those fine individuals. Those famous quotations that we find we were people that were lost. We were people that were you know, barbaric people that we, we were. And we find that Islam took us from the you know, dunya, from the restriction of this earth and took us where? To the light of glory, of victory. And as you find the companions, this isn't history. This is the reality. Barefooted individuals, disheveled state, ripped clothing. You know what they did? They conquered this earth. That's what they did. Because why? Because of that Iman and that faith that they had. And that's that Islam, the blessing of Islam was the greatest thing that they discovered. Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihadha Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guided us to this, to Al-Islam. That's the greatest ultimate blessing upon all of us. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided us to Islam, we don't know where we would be. Could be mushrikun, disbelievers, atheists, juhal, fusaq, whatever person could be. But Islam is the one that came and reformed those individuals and reforms all of us to bring out the best of the individual. And that is exactly what we reform the youth. When people talk about projects of this and projects of that, it's just the simple message of Islam. The beauty in the Orthodox teaching of Islam will automatically reform the youth. A youth may be uh, bad, may be evil or whatever it may be, but in comparison to many of the companions that you find, it's still trivial. The type of life that some of the companions you live, you'd be shocked at what they carried out throughout their life and how Islam came and it purified them. Thus you find Allah wali yulladina aman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the wali, is a protector of those who believe, takes them out from the realms of darknesses and brings them where? To the light of Islam. 
Likewise, read the life of Zayd bin Thabit. Zayd bin Thabit was the one who was a scribe, he used to write for the Prophet Muhammad and write the Quran, preserve it. And that's we find you look at the compilations of the Quran inside uh, uh, the beginning uh, of Sahih al Bukhari that we find the beginning of the compilation of the Quran. Abu Bakr went to who? He went to Zayd bin Thabit and asked him to write. And then what did he say about him? He said, Inna kala rajulun shabun. You are a young individual and we have no blame upon you and you are intelligent and a sharp-witted individual and we want you to write the Quran once again. So he was a young individual who wrote for the Prophet Muhammad and now writing once again at the time of Abu Bakr and the As-Siddiq radiallahu anhu Al-Hassan wal Hussein. Classified as what? The two young individuals, the leaders of the young individuals were in paradise to read about their life and their devotion and in their commitment. Likewise, read the life of other young individuals. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz has been classified as the fifth Khalifa. Read about his life. Uh, 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 you find Imam Ayyub al-Sakhtiyani, Imam al-Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad. Read about their life. Imam Sufyan al thawri Imam Sufyan ibn Riyayna. Read through their life. Young individuals, how they were devoted towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read the life of Imam al Nawawi as we began with. At the age of 10, if you go and pick up Riyadh al-Salihin, you read the introduction of Muqaddama talking about his life at the age of 10 whilst the children were telling him to come outside and play he used to cry he didn't want to play with the kids he wanted to get on with his studies I'm not saying that we should stop our youth from playing football or whatever it may be but we need to create work upon certain individuals that we begin to train them to become people of lofty goals and lofty aspirations if we just think of becoming the average Muslim then it will be the average results and the Quran mentioned وَاسْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ Have patience and commitment and devotion like the five blessed Anbiya beginning with Nuh alayhi salam and then Musa and Ibrahim wa Isa wa Nabiyuna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam Remain committed, read about the life of these individuals Ibrahim alayhi salam, read about his life A young boy who challenged the idols, who spoke out against his people and as they said that, indeed we've heard about a young boy who's done this to our idols, speaking ill of our idols, bring this young boy in front of us. I remain committed. Nuh alayhi salam, talking to his people for how long? 950 years. Qala Rabbi inni da'utu qawmi laylan wa nahara. Oh my Lord, I call my people day and night in public and secret. Every time I call them, they thrust their fingers in their ears, they took their garments and they placed it over their heads. That's how rude the people were. But what did Nuh alayhi salam he do? He bared that. He carried on that journey. Isa alayhi salam what they attributed to him that you are the son of a woman who committed adultery he, put, he bore that carried on his journey and as he, and he praised his mother that she was a pure woman and likewise the mo- most of them who is uh, the most amongst them who is in difficulties with Musa alayhi salam and then you find the Prophet Muhammad sallam. so they all persevered in their life and that's the lesson that we take from their life to persevere to carry out that journey towards in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like what you find if it wasn't any amongst people may think about the, the scholars and these blessed individuals How about look at the life of some of the conquerors Go look at their life You find amongst them Muhammad ibn Qasim al-Thaqafi was known as Fatih al-Fatih al-Sindi wal-Hind Muhammad ibn Qasim the one who conquered and ruled over the land of Sindh at the moment the area of, 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 of the side of Pakistan that we find in the Hind and India as well who ruled and governed and conquered at what age? 17 years old 17 years old is classified as a person who conquered the whole of that region. Like when you read about the life of Yuni, who the class of Sultan Muhammad al Fatih, at the age of what 14? His father made him the Sultan at the age of 10, and at the age of 14, he takes out his first troops. And then his fa- he calls his father, his father's gone into retirement, into seclusion. His father says, Look, I'm not going to come out and lead this battle. You know, that's your task now. So he says to his father, that if you've made me the Sultan, then not as your son, as a Sultan, I command you to come out and to lead this battle and expedition. Look at the understanding of this young individual. Our young individuals can't care less what's taking place in the world. As long as we get our fish and chips and whatever it may be and enjoy our life, that's what that concerns us. I'm not saying that we should go out and we should rebel or whatever it may be. I'm trying to highlight at the end of the day, if you want to gain lofty goals, it's taken 150 years to dismantle our people and to break it all apart. So it's going to be a very long journey to build the bridge once again. So we need to build that bridge. 
The future will always be bright with what? With the shabab, with the youth. If the shabab become corrupt, then that is the downfall of this Muslim ummah. So we need to revive that once again about the youth and the young individuals. And a side point, inshallah, we're all young. Because according to Sharia, linguistically, anybody under the age of 40 is classified as what? A young individual. So those of you who might be slightly 40, don't put your hand up. <laughs> then you're slightly going beyond that limit. Apart from that, the rest of us, inshallah, are very close. You know, some of us are very close to 40. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq and ability to become amongst those individuals. الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَهُ We hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow it to the best of their ability inside their lives. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take our youth away from the facade and the corruption to bring them back to a life of purity and devotion and to commitment and to keep all of us away from the ma'asi, the dhanub, the sins, the fawahish ma dhahra minha wa ma batan wa akhulu qawli hadha wa astaghfiru lali wa lakum wa li jami'il muslimin wa astaghfiru inna wa al-ghafuru al-rahim subhanahu wa bihamdik shiru al-la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru wa atubu alayhi wa barakallahu fi khubu